Hello, good evening, and welcome to today's session on BIC Streams, Golden Gods with Unblinking Eyes, Tanjore and Mysore style paintings from the Kuldeep Singh collection. This session is in collaboration with the Prakriti Foundation and Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangralay. Joining us on this session are art historian Anna Talapikola, who will be in conversation with the founding trustee of Prakriti Foundation, Ranveer Shah. Before I hand over to Renuka Muthuswamy from the CSMVS, uh, thank you, Renuka, for joining us on this session. We have uh, two very quick instructions. We will post the full bios of the speakers in the chat box and do post your questions, comments, observations, and comments through the session in the Q&A box. With that, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Ranveer. And over to you, Renuka. Thank you, Raghu. Welcome everybody and uh, welcome on behalf of the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrale. We're very happy to be collaborating with the Bangalore International Center and the Prakriti Foundation. We're so happy to have Dr. Anna here um, addressing a collection which the museum received as a bequest um, from Kuldeep Ji. Kuldeep Singh's collection is now housed at the museum, this beautiful array of Tanjore paintings that he collected over his lifetime. Um, the museum itself will be celebrating its centenary, commemorating 100 years of being open to the public next year. And um, it is quite right that we pay homage to his great collection at the museum uh, through a wonderful exhibition that is going to be set up. And it will be open to the public in January. So please join us at the museum in Mumbai in January and uh, you will get to see these wonderful collections that, of course, Dr. Anna will tell us more about today. Uh, so, Dr. Anna, without further delay, I hand over to you. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. It's my great pleasure today to be again with you, with the Bangalore International Center, with the Prakriti Foundation, and of course, with the CSMVS, a museum which is especially dear to me because it was my first port of call once that arrived in India for the first time. It was the first place that I visited and I still have a lovely memory of those days. Mind you, this was over 50 years ago. So now, um, pardon me for making some autobiographical notes. Uh, I remember that quite early in life, I came across some bad reproductions of Mysore and Tanjavur paintings. And being in, and I was very much intrigued by them and I wanted to know, know much more about them. However, I had to wait till 1973 until I finally saw one, so to speak, life in the house of a friend. Admittedly, it was not a very good piece, but still it didn't put me off. Much later, during one of my yearly visits to India, I heard by mere chance of the existence of a big collection of Tanjavur paintings. And I didn't know um, who was the owner of the, this collection. And eventually I came to know through a mutual friend of Mr. Kuldeep Singh and myself, that he was the owner of the collection. And this friend of mine said, oh, I'm going to introduce you to him. So on the 1st of March, 1991, as you see, I remember the date very well. Uh, I met Mr. Kuldeep Singh for the first time in Chennai. Next uh, item, please. The next slide, please. And on entering his uh, uh, apartment, I was absolutely bowled over with these two paintings. The 16 Ganeshas were on my left and the Chidambaram Nataraja was used to hang in opposite the city. So it was the grandest introduction that one could have to Tanjavur paintings. Mr. Kuldipsi was extremely generous throughout the 30 years of our, um, uh, our uh, friendship, if I may uh, talk about friendship. And we were always in touch very loosely. Uh, 
But very soon he said, oh yes, I could have access to his collection. He gave me a set of um, color photographs, which I could study. And eventually he started talking about the possibility of a book. You can imagine that I was absolutely over the moon. I said, ah, oh, this is what I waited all my life. It's coming to pass, you know. Unfortunately, both of us were very much involved in our own things. And after a long talk about the um, book, the possibility of a book, there was a long silence. And eventually, on the 18th of December of 2015, I received an email and he informed me, informed me and I quote, his collection was complete. I didn't know what he meant, absolutely, because it seemed me, to me to be so perfect all those years before, never mind. And he said, the conservation of the paintings had been completed, the photographic documentation was almost done. And so the Tanjaur painting book that we had spoken about perhaps 15 years before could go ahead. Next, please. What he meant, I suppose, with the collection being complete is that in the meantime, it had grown to 350 items. There were Tanjaur paintings, an exquisite group of, of perhaps 45 Mysuru paintings, a couple of Kerala works, some compar comparatively rare items from Rajamundri and Surapura, painted prints, reverse glass paintings, as you see here on the screen. Next, please, and woodcuts. So we met first in Bombay early in 2016, then again in New Delhi in January 17th. And on that occasion, we had a very long session along with uh, the Mysore painting expert, R.G. Singh, which paintings had to be included in the book and which not. As you can imagine, it was a very laborious session because we couldn't really decide. There were so many beautiful things and how are we going to fit them all in 140 pages? Impossible. So, in, and anyhow, we, we uh, made a selection and then I started, we started, I mean, even Mr. Kuldeep Singh, Mr. R.G. Singh and I started, started on our parts of the book. And um, one thing which I would like to note here is that while North Indian painting, especially Mughal, Rajput, Pahari, and so on, has been and continues to be the focus of intense scholarly investigation, South Indian paintings is practically unknown. Uh, perhaps unknown is not the correct uh, word. Perhaps it has been ignored because it's difficult to, um, to um, access. However, the pictorial output of the Nayaka and the Marathas, be it murals, book paintings, reverse glass paintings, um, album paintings, is unknown but to a very few aficionados of the genre. And the publications are not very many. As a matter of fact, I think that you can count them on, your, on the fingers of your hand, optimistically seen. Now, one thing which is unclear to people who work on Indian painting in general is that during the 18th and 19th century, uh, a very distinctive style of painting was um, practice and flourished in what was then known the Madras presidency. And you all know how a Tanjavur painting looks like. So for instance, there are sumptuous depictions of gods, goddesses and saints embellished with gold leaves, with uh, tiny stones, precious stones or pieces of glass, then gilded fragmented mirrors and so on and so forth. And there is the very typical gesso work, which 
imparts a three-dimensional um, look to the painting. And this is something very interesting because you have the passage from the flat surface of the painting to a three-dimensional um, sense of the, for instance, the murti is shown three-dimensionally, uh, as you see it in the, in the Garbagruha of the temples. It's a very interesting experiment in aesthetics. And this kind of mixture, let's say, of three-dimensionality and of flat painting, started much earlier. May I have the next uh, slide, please? Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with these, which we museums are called portable art, uh, altars. And these are boxes about 50 centimeters in height. At the center, you have the murti, three-dimensional murti, and here you have Sri Venkateshwara flanked by Balakrishna and by Sri Ram. And on the leaves of the door, which you can stretch out, this one stretches to, the, to one, one um, meter and 40 centimeters, you have lots of interesting mythological um, depictions, incidents, for, inc for instance, what you see here on the left, incidents from the life of Krishna, then various aspects of Vishnu, then you have scenes from the Ramayana, scenes from the Bhagavata. Anyhow, you have a whole array of paintings, and it has been suggested by a colleague of mine that these were used by storytellers while they were illustrating, while they were narrating the, the stories of the various gods and goddesses. Unfortunately, we have only four or five of these shrines. This one on the screen is the oldest. It was acquired in Madras in 1733, and it arrived in Germany in 1734. This is practically the first, the first um, known portable art which reached Europe. The other four are in one in Oxford, which I saw myself, and this is the later, a later one of the 19th century. There is one in Munich and two in Rome in the Vatican Museum. Uh, now, if you have, a, if you look at the aesthetics obtaining in this early, in this um, portable shrine, you will recognize many stylistic similarities with what was to be known late, much later as Tanjavur, quote unquote, painting. Why do I say Tanjavur in quote unquote? Because Tanjavur is the name given to this genre, and I feel that is a bit of a misnomer because it seems to refer, when you say Tanjavur, everybody thinks, ah, yes, Tanjavur town. But no, I have the feeling that the town of Tanjavur, yes, it's the place where it came, the style came to a maturity, where it flourished under the enlightened patronage of Sir Fuji II. The second. But um, a similar style flourished at the other centers, the most important of which were Tiruchirappalli, Srirangam, and Madurai, probably. We don't know very much about it because it's very difficult now to reconstruct the genealogies of the artists who were working at the time. However, according to the uh, art history scholar, the late uh, Miss Jaya Pasani, a very similar idiom obtained in the area of today's Andhra Pradesh. And this seems to, uh, in a certain sense, to confirm my suspicion that perhaps the style originated in Northern, in, in the, in what is today Southern Andhra Pradesh, but probably there were other um, centers of these styles of which we don't know much. You know, it's all 
it's a work in progress and we have still to learn much more before um, before uh, saying something definitive we are in a I, I should say we are just they are just finding our way through this maze of possibilities. Next, please. Two personalities were responsible for the development of painting in Mysuru, in Mysuru and in Tanjavur. You see, Sir Foji II, which I mentioned to you, uh, was a man who was very much interested in the arts, in literature, in science. It was a sort of a polymath, and you should just see the fantastic library that he put together, and it's now in the Saraswati Mahal in Tanjavur near the uh, palace. The other person who gave a decisive impetus to the painting in Mysuru is Muhammad Krishna Rajavudayar. And probably he is the creator of the Mysuru school of painting with its very elegant, as you will see presently, subtle chromatic shades, very discreet use of gold, and you know a very different stylistic aura very different from the Chanjavur um, paintings. And you'll see it now. Uh, this traditional form of art, unfortunately, did not survive after, let's say, 1910, 1920. Uh, a British officer, Francis Hemingway, states in his uh, Tanjur Gazetteer, some good painting is done at Tanjur by, by men of the Raju caste. They, painted on, they paint on wooden tablets or cloths made beautifully smooth with a paste of powder gum and gum. And their drawing is correct. The tints employed astonishingly delicate and even. And here comes something which is very important to remember. But the designs are seemingly confined to the Hindu gods and heroes, and the finished pictures are grotesquely adorned with sparkling stones or pieces of metal. Painting and drawing are commoner in this than in other districts. In large towns, the temple walls and even the walls of private residences are often covered with figures of gods and heroes or drawn or painted with considerable skill. So here we have a cautious approval of Tanjavur painting. It's obvious that the adorning, the, the, the relief on the uh, flat surface and the sparkling stone and pieces of metal made a European probably used to very, very, how would I say, tame colors and composition. It made it cringe absolutely cringe, but never mind. Uh, it was like that and it, thank God that there are things and, and other things because this is exactly what makes the paintings very attractive, at least this is my mind. However, by the time in which Hemingway wrote, social and political changes with the increasing popularity of uh, um, photography and the introduction of the chromolithographs um, changed completely the scenario. And unfortunately, the artists were not so much in demand because people could get chromolithographs, uh, which were much easier to um, access and probably much cheaper. The repertoire, you see, according to uh, Francis uh, Hemingway, the repertoire was uh, confined to Hindu gods or heroes. That's not true. However, before studying the collection of Mr. Kuldeep Singh, I was convinced that this was true. However, there I found that the repertoire of the artists was much wider than we, what we thought. As a matter of fact, Apart from the paintings dealing with, with religious subjects, which are undoubtedly the majority, you have themes such as portraiture, 
suffice to see this what you have in front of you. Uh, there are auspicious symbols. So for instance, Chakra Shanka and Nama, uh, you have uh, a vast number of portraits, not only of rulers, but ordinary people who made well from themselves. And I shall see, uh, show you two portraits of ordinary people. And a vast number of botanical and natural history drawings, which were executed by the artists who were hired by the British uh, scientists to copy uh, flora and the flora and fauna of India. Of course, um, Tanjavur artists were also responsible for murals. Uh, wall paint, uh, 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 yes, murals, reverse, on, reverse paint, painting on glass, and lots of album paintings. And these album paintings are now uh, very popular. Uh, each British museum, each, each, I should say, each museum in Britain has a vast array of these sets depicting the traits and castes of India. And of course, gods and goddesses and so on and so forth. Now, the next, please, we are going to explore very briefly, as briefly as possible, the uh, repertoire of the painters. So for instance, Indian epics. The Ramayana inscribed in the Sudarshana chakra, a superb tour de force to fit the main uh, episodes of the Ramayana, it starts from the top, um, top uh, flame or in the chakra, and it ends at the center with the Rama Pakta Bishika. And all around you have the story of Rama. On the uh, right, you have a visual retelling of the Mahabharata. And this is a very tall order because uh, trying to summarize the Mahabharata is it's a very arduous enterprise. However, here the painter uh, did it beautifully, and you have to read the painting. Incidentally, the captions are in Telugu. You have to read the painting from the bottom on. You see the first in the bottom row, you have the Pandavas in Indra Prashta, then you have some adventures. Eventually in the third row, you have the crucial meeting between, Krish, uh, and between um, Krishna is lying on his bed, Arjuna sits at his feet, Duryodhana at his head. And of course, there is the question of whether Krishna will participate in the Kurukshetra battle as a person, non-combatant, or if one gets Krishna's army. However, the top is dedicated to the great battle. And I would like you to, rem to pay attention to the Vishwarupa, which towers in the middle of the top um, register. Next, please. And this form is probably copied or inspired by this absolutely stunning representation of Vishwarupa from Mysore. You can appreciate the universal form of Vishnu devouring all the, um, the, the, the soldiers and the heroes all in the great battle. And he's seated on this chariot drawn by four horses, the four Vedas. And then you see all the flames issuing, uh, I should, uh, no, really tongues issuing from the mouth of the, this supernatural creature, a fantastic painting. I mean. uh, the next, please. Another interpretation of the Vishwarupa is this one much more tame. On the right, you have the rendering of Vishwarupa according to the Pauranic description. So the figure is enclosed in an oval, probably hinting at the golden egg. Then 
you see at the bottom of the painting, you have the Shvita Baraha. On top of him is the tortoise Akupara. Then you have Shishanaga and the eight Digdaja supporting the oval. And then of course, all the creatures which populate the earth. On the left, however, you have another interpretation of the Vishvarupa of the goddess Shri Chamundishvari. And you see the same uh, oval golden frame encloses the whole universe to, at the center of which is Jambudvipa. It's the small um, uh, square with of various colors from which emerges Mount Meru. It's a river in the form of a reversed cone. And then of course, all the other words. The next please. Pauranic stories. Here is a painting of the Samudra Mantana by one of the great court artists, Durgada Krishnappa. It's a very interesting painting because to my mind, it represents two stories at the same time. Admittedly, it is the Samudra Mantana because you have the Asuras on one side and the Devas and they are churning and doing all what they have to do. And the Kurma is at the base of Mount Mandara. Sri Lakshmi thrones in the middle of the painting. She is the, uh, uh, how does it, the, the most important figure on the painting. On the left, you have Parvati uh, pressing Shiva's uh, throat in order to prevent him from swallowing the poison which issued from the sea. And on the right, you have Mohini, which is what you expect from a, from a painting of the Samudra Mantana. However, in this case, Mohini is not seducing the Azura or distracting the Azuras. Uh, in order to prevent them from getting the Amruta, but she's seducing the Rishis. To my mind here, two stories have been conflated. On the one side, you have the Samudra Mantana. On the other side, you have the story of Bhikshatana and Mohini descending to earth in order to, pride the, uh, to curb the pride of the Rishis of the pine forest. Uh, on the top of the painting, you have, of course, the beautiful things which emerged from the churning of the sea. The next piece is a rather interesting painting from a lesser known school, the one uh, which I mentioned before, Raja Mahindri or Raja Mundri. And this school was first identified by Mr. Jagdish Mittal in the late 60s. At the time he was working at the Völkerkunde Museum in Hamburg, which is the Ethnology Museum in Hamburg. And he discovered a set of 86 folios, including 53 Ramayana illustrations, 33 pictures of the gods. And most importantly of all, this um, set had a date and the provenance. And the origin was given as Rajamundri, and the date was given, it was the equivalent of 750, 1757. Uh, this painting in the collection of Mr. Kuldeep Singh is a very good example, stylistic example of the paintings of Rajamahendri. You see, they are very uh, spacious. You have this big Balakrishna. Narada in the middle floating in the air, and the two cursed Gandharvas emerging from the um, Yamalarjuna trees, uh, which have been broken by the child Krishna. And on the sky, you have the two golden uh, Vima Vimanas, which are ready for the two Gandharvas to, to step in and ascend to heaven. And another very interesting thing is the uh, configuration of the sky with these very characteristic scalloped um, clouds, as well another characteristic of the Rajamundi painting are these trees with these round crowns. If you compare this 
with the Gajendra, Gajendra Moksha opposite here by one of the great artists from the Mysore school, um, Javagal Narasimhaya. You see, that's completely another uh, aesthetic feeling. First of all, the composition is much more dense, filled with things. On the left, you have uh, the elephant being, Gajendra being caught by the crocodile and the crocodile is being decapitated as Vishnu, with Vishnu's chakra. And you see the, the blood spurting around. Then, of course, the elephant and is blessed by Vishnu and the two cursed creature, the crocodile and an elephant assume again the human form and ascend to heaven in their golden chariots. A very, very, very nice painting, very, how would I say, poetic, really. The next, please. Again, you see my sort of painting, in my, my sort of painting has this very, very delicate things, very, yes, as I told you before, poetic, very, very easy on the eye. It's not violent. It's just, you know, even here, you see this Chamundeshwari by, again, by Durga Krishnapa, which was the artist of the Samudra Mantana. She's there almost smiling. You see, no effort in killing Chandan Munda. No, she's confident there, stepping on the bodies of the uh, Asuras and on the right, you have this lovely uh, group, Rama group, Rama, Lakshmana, Anjaneya, and Sita. And what is interesting here, if you have uh, good eyes and you, you can see, you can note on the foreheads of um, Rama and Lakshmana, the Madhvatilaka, which, and this leads us to think that the painting was commissioned by a Madhva family. The next, please. Here we enter all in another um, territory. Uh, local heroes celebrated in folk ballads. On the left, you have Madhurai Viran. Uh, I don't know if he was a historic figure or not, However, he's the hero of a great ballad, full of adventures, of elopements, gory and gory details. I mean, you have all the most, most incredible adven uh, adventures which you can imagine. And it ends dramatically with him decap decapitating himself in front of the goddess Minakshi and be thus becoming her guardian. If you go to Madurai and you go to the South Gate, South Gopura of the great uh, Minakshi Sundarishwara temple, you will find a shrine dedicated to Madurai Viran. And on the right, there is another local hero. But this hero was not interested in fighting or having adventures or God knows, you know, doing all kinds of, uh, um, up to all kinds of mischief, but rather he was interested in spiritual striving and divine grace. And this is Male Madhishvara or Male Mahadishvara, which, who is believed by many to be a saint traveling on a tiger, while the Vira Shaivas consider him an incarnation of Shiva uh, and identify him with the Shiva Linga, which is enshrined in the temples. In temples dedicated to them in Southeast Karnataka, uh, uh, he is on the outside wall, you have him depicted as a tiger, Whereas inside he is enshrined as a linga in the sanctuary. And this painting uh, shows a combination of the two aspects of Male Mahadeshwara, Saint on a tiger, at the same time, the linga. A very interesting painting, and I believe pretty rare, as far as I'm told from colleagues 
who are in the know about these things. A big, great theme, the next please, a great theme of Tanjavur paintings and of course of, main, of uh, South Indian painting in general, murals too, are the secret sites. What you see here is this huge painting depicting the 108 Divya Deshams. And it was probably commissioned by a Mata or someone like that because the sizes are absolutely humongous. And at the center, unfortunately badly rubbed, is a big shrine, a big temple. Possibly it refers to the temple who, or temple who commissioned this painting. And at the bottom, again, rubbed away probably by the hands of the devotees, I suppose there were the portraits of the Alvars, Acharyas, and religious personalities of Sri Vaishnavism. This is, of course, only a conjecture. We don't really know. And even if you were to examine, as Mr. Kuldeep Singh and I did, and also Mr. R.G. Singh, um, the painting, there is no way that you can make out what was in that uh, lower part of it. Uh, the next, please. Number one among the Sri Vaishnava terrestrial Divyadesham is, of course, Sri Rangam, the Sri Ranganatha temple. And here you have two possibilities of depictions of how to depict the Sri Ranganatha temple. On the left, you have just the plan of the temple town, a magnificent painting. And it shows you exactly where the town lies because you see all around it, you have the cavalry encircling it. At the center, of course, there is the Garbagruha. And a very interesting detail here is this portrait of a Shaiva Sanyasi on the right. And it turns out that this is Ariakudi Chidambaram Chityar who in 1860 uh, constructed a choultry, which still exists. It is at the, in the outermost prakara of the temple town, and now doubles at Aspachala. And considering the position of this portrait, along with the, praka, uh, with the positioning of the prakara, it's perhaps a hint to the viewer where to look for the prakara. As a matter of fact, it is more or less exactly there. And I found it following this painting. Uh, for religious purposes, of course, if you have a puja room, then you would have the painting here on the right, focusing on the main shrines in the innermost prakara of the temple. So you have the shrine of Sri Ranganatha, and on the left, you have the shrine of Nammalvar, and up on the corner of Ranganayake, on the right, you have the shrine of Sri Ramanuja, and on top of the, the Chandra Pushkarin. The next, please. We come now to the second of the most important Divyadesham, which is, of course, Tirmalai. Sri Venkateshwara at the center. This is a puja box, which you can close when you are not having your puja. And at the center, of course, Sri Venkateshwara, which is consort. On the left, there is Lakshmi Varaha, on the right, Lakshmi. And I was made aware by Mr. R.G. Singh while we were in Delhi discussing this painting, that this is a sort of a memento of the trip of a pilgrim to the main shrine. As a matter of fact, pilgrims are um, encouraged to worship, first of all, the Lakshmi Varaha Shrine on Tirumala Hill, the Varaha Temple, I think it's called, because Varaha is the first, was the first god on the hill, and hence he has to be worshipped first, and then proceed to um, Shivankateshwara Shrine. On the, outer leaf, on the outer leaves of the box, you have the Vaishnava Dwarapalas, Jaya and Vijaya. 
The next, please. There are 275 uh, Shaiva Stalam. And what you see here is a pretty faithful representation of the Tayumanava temple on the golden rock and the shrine of Suganda Kuntalambala. Beautiful, absolutely extraordinary. You, can, you see the panorama of the golden rock and the two temples, and on the top, you have the small shrine of Uchipilaya, the tall Ganesha. And I don't know if you can see them, there are about five pilgrims making their way up there. What is fascinating is the emphasis that the artist plays on the way of getting there. It's true, there are lots of pillar corridor while you get up the rock and lots of steps. Eventually, you arrive at the fort and you see the temple. The small, on the left, you have a very small tepakulam, the temple tank, and the lower border is occupied by the Utsava Murtis being uh, uh, paraded to town. The next one, please, is again one of the important Shaiva Stalams. The southern, um, the southern Shikala Hastis claim to be the southern Kailasha because a small hill near the temple is believed to be a replica of the Himalayan Kailasta. And the river Swarnamuki, who flows uh, along the uh, very near the temple, is supposed to be the Ganga. Now, Sri Kalahasti has a very interesting uh, story how the temple began. There was a spider whose name was Sri. There was a snake whose name was Kala, and there was an elephant. All three of them were devotees of the Shiva Linga. And what you see here, I'm afraid that in this painting, the painter didn't put the spider, which is a bit of a, I mean, I'm sad about it, but in another painting in the collection of Mr. Singh, you have a huge spider that you can see it well. And you have the hoods of the snake uh, sheltering the linga and the two tusks of the elephants enshrining, uh, protecting it as it were. It's a sort of halo. On the, le on the left, you have an important person. It's Kannapanayan uh, Mahar. Uh, the devotee who offered his eyes to Shiva, to whom uh, puja is due to be offered prior to accessing the main linga. On the right, you have the goddess consort. Um, unfortunately, because of the time, I cannot show you more of this deviation, so I have to uh, quickly go to Palani one of the six abodes of Sri Urgan. And it is in Palani where the God appeared, manifested himself in the guise of a very young recluse um, with a small loincloth, shaven head, with a stick, a danda, with a, I don't know how you call it, a staff is the English word, and with his typical Spear, the veil. Uh, the, main th the main emphasis in the painting is, of course, the representation of, uh, of Danda Yudapani. However, the artist inserted also hints of the landscape, the hilly uh, region around Palani. Then you have a procession with the cart and a procession, a procession where the um, Utsava Murtis of Subramania is um, carried and the cart festival. The next thing which is something which I had never seen before studying the collection of um, Mr. Kuldeep Singh were the philosophical and theological uh, Paintings. May I have the next one, please? Oh, sorry. 
forgot the most important, Jain. It's not only you have um, ho giant, um, Hindu holy places, but also Jain holy places. And this uh, perhaps is, a, how would I say, a bit of a fanciful view of Sravana Belagola. Unfortunately, the writing is very much faded away and it was not possible to read the captions on the left and the right temples. But it is possible that this is the statue of Gomateshwara at the center, although Gomateshwara, as we all know, is in plain, is in the, in, in the open and left and right, or the, and the, the, the Vindyagiri and the Chandragiri, but as I told you, it's just a supposition. I'm not sure, really. And until we find a way of reading the caption, it's, um, it's a supposition. It's an hypothesis at, at best. Next, please. Yeah, what I was telling you before. Theological paintings. This is Namalvar, the fountainhead of Tengalai Sri Vaishnavism. I had never seen something like that before. And I was absolutely amazed at the quantity of uh, detail, at the quality, qu first of all, the quality of the painting and then the density of details. On the uh, upper um, register, you have Vaikuntha with all the liberated souls worshiping and contemplating Vishnu. Then you have, uh, you see that blue, uh, area is the Milky Sea, in, and then the main um, part of the painting is devoted to Namalvar sitting there in teaching attitude. And what you see behind him is the famous tamarind tree, which is on worship till today at Alvar Tirunagari, which is in near Tirunelveli. And he's there and if you look carefully, you will see all these small uh, figures. And these are the 106 terrestrial deviations which are shown behind him. To the left and the right in the first row are the Alvars, then come the Acharyas. And at the center of the painting, immediately beneath um, uh, Namalvar's feet are the main uh, main uh, philosophers, acharyas uh, of Sri Vaishnavism, Manavala Mamunigal, Pillai Lokacharya, and other such personalities. It's, I mean, it's a magnificent painting that you should see it. I hope that when the exhibition at the um, museum in Mumbai will take place, this painting will have the pride of place because it's Astonishing. The next, please. There are the 63 Shaiva saints, the Nayan Mars. And what you see on the left is a painting depicting the salient uh, episodes in the life of the 63 Nayan Mars. And on the right, you have the Nalvar, the four river, revered ones. And from right to left, you have, first of all, the child Sambandar. Then you have Appar and Sundarar, which are the three, three of the principal poet saints or among the Nayanmar. And then the last one is Manikavachakar, the great mystic. He was never. Uh, included in the list of the Nayan Mars because he was born after them uh, in the ninth century, while Sundarar, who lived in the eighth century, compiled the first canonical list of the 63 Nayan Mars. This list then was elaborated upon, and the poet Sekilar during the 12th century, wrote the famous Periyap Puranam, in which he narrates the life of the 63 Nayan Mars. The next, please. There were uh, sets 
of the life of the 63 Nayan Mars, individual, individual paintings depicting the life of the 63 Nayan Mars as reverse glass paintings, whole collections. Now here you have the story of Tirupuli Putondar Nayan Mar, who was a washerman and a yogi came one day and asked him to wash his clothes. So he did. And when it was the time of drying the cloth, it started raining. In the desperation of not being able to give back the clothes to the yogi, Tirukuri Putondar started bashing his head on the stone on which he was uh, washing the clothes. And you see that a hand, Shiva's friend, emerges from the stone in order to soften the impact. The other one is Tirunila Kantar Nayanmar, is a rather complex story in the sense that the couple that you see in the water were very devoted to each other and had no children and were great devotees of Shiva. One day, however, Tirunila Kantar made an committed an indiscretion and his furious wife told him never to touch her or any other woman for that matter. And one day a yogi came by, of course, known by Shiva, with a pot and said to uh, Tirunila Kantar, who was a potter, said, could you please keep the pot? I'm going to collect it later. So no problem. Tirunila Kantar took the pot. And when the uh, yogi came back, returned, the pot had disappeared. The yogi said, ah, you have stolen it. Tirunila Kantar said, no, it's impossible. I, I, I haven't stolen. He said, well, if you have, if you, you have to swear that you didn't, stole the, you didn't steal the pot. And you have to go into the temple tank in the water, holding the hand of your son. And he said, well, I have no son. Huh? What? And he said, well, then you take, you touch the hand of your wife. And he said, I can't touch the hand of my wife. And the yogi obliged compelled Tirunila Kantar to confess his indiscretion to the assembled uh, people, which you see here on the left. So he said, well, the only thing to do is to take a stick on one side is my wife, on one side is, I will hold the stick the other side. So they went into the water. When they emerged, the yogi had disappeared and they were young again and devoted their life to Shiva. This is the story of Tirunila Kantar, Myanmar. The next please, it's something very different. This is Guru Nanak and his followers, disciples. And what is particularly interesting of, on this, of this, um, in this painting is that it is a faithful reproduction of a woodcut image which was which is dated around 1870, one exemplar of which is here in London at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And it's a lovely painting showing Guru Nanak with Bala and Mardana and all the other ones. And it shows you the width, the, the, the range of topics which uh, the Tanjavur painter were familiar with. And on this um, topic, I would like to show you the next uh, slides, which is another kind of thing, totally different. You have yantras, this famous Brahmanya yantra. At the center is Dandayuda Pani, and the six, I, six heads of Murgan and, uh, are, um, surround the main uh, image. And on the other, you have the other, so on the right side, you have the Navagrahas. Beautifully executed, very fine. And let's pass now to the last part of this talk, which is deals with portraits. The next, please. And we go to Mysore. And here you have two outstanding examples of Mysore portraiture. The one on the top is Mumadi Krishna Raja, 
with the, in the European Darbar. And the very interesting part of this is that the three European gentlemen are from, le uh, from uh, left to right, Colonel Codrington, Dr. McGrail, and the resident, Mr. Uh, Colonel Mark Cobham. I was taught by Mr. Um, R.G. Singh, who is a great connoisseur of my Zulu painting, that he could identify also the courtiers who were sitting there. And again, from my Zulu, you have the group portrait of five artists. A proud, uh, I mean, it's a fantastic painting of Gotugara Tipana, who was, this is the gentleman seated with the bolster behind his um, shoulders. He was the chief of the atelier of, uh, at uh, the Maizu court with four other colleagues. And uh, I am told by Mr. R.G. Singh, whom I told you he's a connoisseur, that these uh, five painters served the Baudelaire court from 1850 to 1910. So you have a whole over 50 years, 60 years of Mysore paintings and artists concentrated in one painting. Let's pass now to the ordinary people. Next, please. Obviously, a well-to-do accountant with his wife in their mansion, a very interesting mansion with neoclassical columns and uh, chandeliers and so on and so forth. And obviously the accountant, incidentally, the, his face is copied from a photograph. He's there with his wife and he is portrayed near his uh, puja, uh, tipoi, on top of which there is a painting showing Chidambaram Nataraja, Shivakami, Patanjali Vyagrapada, in some, the Chidambaram group. And the other one are, is a, are, a, are a couple who are devotees of the, the Parthasarathi temple in uh, Tiruvallikeni in Chennai. Here again, the, photo, the face are um, copied from photographs. It's very interesting. There are some more of these paintings of quote unquote ordinary citizens that the great majority of them is uh, portrayed along with their family deity. So it is perhaps an, uh, a way of, uh, I don't know, maybe a sort of devotional thing at the same time it's supported. It's not clear where is there the, the, the um, which, which is the main thrust of the painting. Is it the devotional part as it's here in the group, in the couple worshiping uh, Parta Sarati or is it in the wealth and power of the accountant and his wife? Yes, he, there is Nataraja, but he's there quite prominent, sporting his uh, Tripundra marks all over the body, but he seems to be the person who's the most important in the painting. Now, what happens with the Tanjavur style? As I told you, by perhaps 1920 or so, Things uh, had the, the, the social mores had uh, changed. And the paintings which were originally commissioned in the 19th and early 20th century for worship by people who had a private uh, puja room, by matas or by temples, lost their popularity with the emergence of the chromolithographs printing and the much cheaper calendar prints, which were popular and widespread. And unfortunately, by the 1950s, 1960s, all these beautiful paintings were removed from the old houses 
and either thrown away or sold as antiques to the curio shops or uh, similarly. And they were in those days, I remember vividly, uh, they were absolutely ignored by the art by the art dealers and art markets. Things, let's say, by the 1980s changed dramatically and they became a popular collector item. Now, what's happening now in the 21st century? Uh, Matas uh, do commission such paintings and the majority of works are, but the majority of works are found in corporate office, in the hotel lobbies, where as have I seen, uh, Kaliana Mantapas, and to my enormous amazement, at Chennai Airport, you have quite an extensive set of tanger, modern tangible paintings. Now, with the context of their placement completely changed, their sizes and their themes had to adjust to the customer's demand. And while the traditional themes of Hindu gods and goddesses are still popular. There are other themes which creep in, such as Christian themes, Muslim themes, and symbolic motifs. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, I hope that you it was a bit rushed, but I hope that you could get uh, an idea of the great variety of this outstanding collection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. That was wonderful. We learned so much in the past hour from re-looking at these paintings through your eyes. And I'm sure it must have been a wonderful many years of friendship for you with Kuldeep Singh to have viewed these paintings over time and to have interpreted them in many wonderful ways. I want to start by taking the liberty of asking you a few questions and then I will take questions from the audience. I want to ask you, starting from the very early fact that this is an entire collection and it's wonderful that it is all together and that it has been given the bequest to the CMBS, what is your thought on the role of collectors who collect, whether it is paintings or other genre? Uh, yesterday, I was talking to an art dealer at the, um, this um, London Asia, um, Asian Art Week, and he had a theory. He said, First of all, most collectors are men. 80% of his clients are men who collect. And I asked him, who? Tell me more. And he said that these gentlemen collect not for themselves, but for posterity. Because they think he had a whole theory, he explained me at length. We are all conscious of our mortality. And if we leave something tangible behind, you know, who can enrich someone else, then you don't die. That was his interpretation, whether this is correct or not, but I found it a very, very uh, seductive interpretation, this idea that you live on through your collection. And in some ways, it's very true of this collection, the Kuldeep Singh collection yes. will now live at the museum in Mumbai. And as Renuka shared with us at the beginning of the show, that there will be an exhibition of some of the works early next year. But that also brings me to the question in the sense of what you finished your presentation with about the context and longevity of how a collection has its own life for posterity. Is it through research? Is it through exhibitions? Is it through conserving it for other generations to come? Is it all of the above? 
What is the life of a collection is really my question. I think it's all the three elements which you um, spelled out before. Because you see, I come from Florence and there are, if you think of the Uffizi galleries, I don't know how much stuff, pardon me for being so <laughs> colloquial, in the stores and nobody knows what's there, what's not there. And I feel that, for instance, uh, one should, the museums, it's perhaps the rule of the museum to make their, cons their, their um, collections known and accessible through research and through exhibitions. Because otherwise, what's the use of having all the paintings or drawings or whatever you have? In, in storage. Admittedly, it is a question of space. We all know that. But still, if people work on the collection, if there is a sustained interest, that's different. And I mean, even when I started working at the British Museum on the catalog of their works, I was stunned that none of the curators, they said, oh, yes, yes, we have, we have all, all kinds of South Indian paintings. How many? Mm, we don't know. Maybe 400. It turned out that they have more than 1,000 items. What can I say? Because no one was interested in that specific part of the collection. So they said, OK, yes, we have it. but." We don't know. One of the things that one notices in the new work of Tanjol and Mysore paintings, um, which of course is viewed in a different context, as you mentioned, is that the finesse and the aesthetic sensibility, the line in the drawings, the craftsmanship seems very much more diluted or plainer than the ones that we saw in today's presentation or the earlier ones that are with other people and with other museums. Why do you think that has happened and why has this skill, in a sense, started thinning itself out? Uh, I have the feeling is not so much the, I think that what um, is lacking is the conviction of the old artist is more a question of, uh, how would I say, of state of mind, of being persuaded of what you are. Because if you look at these, uh, uh, the, uh, I saw some modern uh, Mysuru and Tanjavur paintings with some artists. They were technically perfect, but the spark was not there, you know? It's, the, the, there was no feeling in them. At least that was my interpretation. Something was missing. And to recreate that, I don't know how it can be. But how do you think as a collective community of people who are say consumers of new Tanjaur paintings, um, whether it's in the corporate office or it's for your drawing room, how can we find a way to continue this heritage? And how can we, besides buying and supporting the community of artists, find a way to re-inject that spirit of what existed in the older ones? Well, I suppose uh, it's very much up to the artist. It's not up to an external factor. The artists, the artist, him or herself, must be persuaded of what they are doing, you know. And there is nothing you can do from outside. To my mind, it's something which comes from inside. It's a passion. It's something which, you know, you feel the urge, you have to do it, you have to express, you are expressing yourself through the painting. And not, ah, because the, the, the ICC bank wants to, uh, Gaja Lakshmi, then let's do the Gaja Lakshmi, you know, like that. So because of the context, in some ways you're saying of the patron yeah. itself has changed 
Therefore, yes. the spirit of the artist investing yes. his time and energy yes. has also, and the dynamic between client stroke patron and artist therefore has changed itself over yes. time. But of course, we are we are living in an all, all in a different times in a different era. You can't go back, so we have to go. And perhaps there be some uh, evolution in the Tanjavur and Mysore paintings. I don't know, and let's see, let's see what happens. I also was just thinking whether it could also be that now the next you know in our times we don't have actually so much the luxury of time in producing things of great beauty that's true also true in the case of uh, bronzes being cast across the country sculpture jewelry all of it where you see that earlier work was much more finer than what you see presently yes not only this because at that time, probably uh, there was more time, more leisure, and not only this, uh, people perhaps took great pride in what they were doing. And now there is everything must be quick, you know? You have to produce it quickly. You have to be, if it's possible, you give the commission today, but it was better if it was done by yesterday, you know, that kind of serious scenario. One of the questions uh, on the question and answer screen is, do you have a particular favorite? And I don't know whether the question is meant to be a particular favorite from the Kuldeep Singh collection or a painting you've seen elsewhere or in another museum in the Tanjavur painting style. Uh, the problem is I like them all. <laughs> I thought you might say that. <laughs> I like them all. I'm, I'm passionate. To, uh, I like them all. Nothing doing. Another question is uh, from uh, Karun Gali Nalini, who asks, how did our Tanjo paintings find themselves in Germany and in the Vatican museums that you mentioned? Ah, she means the small altars. Ah, yes. That's very interesting. Uh, there was the, the, I think it was the Danish mission in Tarangambadi in those days. And there were uh, German and Danish scholars and of course missionaries going up and down. And the one in Halle was taken back by one of those. And those in the Vatican Museum, it's obviously missionaries collected it, you see. The one in Munich, I don't know, and I don't have the details of that in Oxford, but that would be easily traceable because I can phone them and ask. But it's evident that they came through the missionaries who were operating there, perhaps not so much converting, but writing the famous uh, dictionaries, grammars, and you know, that kind of things. They were very much rather scholars than interested in religion. Um, another question that is very interesting is from Ganesh Shivaswami who asks that, have you encountered Islamic decorative elements in any of the Mysore genre of paintings. You did mention that there are Christian and Muslim related themes in the Tanjore paintings being seen recently, but is there yes. anything in the Mysuru genre as well? Well, if you look for instance at Mysore, now this is a bit not really Islamic, but anyhow, uh, if you look at Mysuru, uh, illuminated manuscripts, all right? And I'm referring here to the great Ramayana um, commissioned by Muma de Krishna Raja, now dispersed. I've seen only the Balakanda in a private collection and the Sundarakanda uh, at the Mysore Palace. The Mahara then Maharaja was very gracious to me and gave me the permission to see the painting. And what stri is striking is how many elements of the Deccani style have filtrated into Mysore painting. 
And this is explained, it's clear, because with the conquest of Golconda by Orangzeb, where you had a fantastic atelier, the uh, artists migrated south. And they landed at the uh, court of the Wodeyas, who were great patrons of the art. And thus is the, I mean, uh, this explains why you have decany elements in my Sulu paintings. And I don't also know if decany elements in Natwara, Pichwais, you yeah. also have, you know, of the wonderful murals in the Mysore Palace, though I don't know the dating, which also have some fantastic. Deccani influences yeah. some of them. Dhruv Chandra asks Anna, would you, uh, what would your opinion be that, is it because of the kind of pigments that are being used now that affects the quality of the work? Are there natural pigments still being used these days? Do you know of that? I'm not sure, but for uh, I'm uh, uh, I, I know that some of the modern painters use acrylics, and to my mind, it's all another ball game if you use natural pigments. But of course, as you just remarked before, you need time to grind the whatever it is on a stone, and then wait, and then you know make it mature, and it's a question of time. Somehow we don't have time. I think that brings us to the end of our questions. I just want to say on behalf of all of the people who attended from different parts of the world, what a wonderful hour and more this has been, not just for me, but I think I speak for the others as well. Thank you so very much. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the CMVS for participating with us. And we are all looking forward to the exhibition next year. Thank you so much, Renuka, and keep us all updated. Thank you also, Bangalore International Center, for setting this up. As usual, your talks are wonderful. And we at Prakriti Foundation are delighted to collaborate on these kind of events. So all in all, I'm going to end by saying thank you, everybody, and a huge virtual applause for Anna and your wonderful sharing of your interpretation of these images from the Kuldeep Singh collection. Thank you thank all. You. Thank Bye -bye. you very much and goodbye.